Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Crash and Ride podcast. I'm Patrick Ferguson. I'm your host. Today's guest is Grant Curry, bass player for the band's Pleasure Club and the New York art rock band Ballroom Dance is Dead, as well as being an Atlanta-based engineer and producer. We talk about depression, divorce, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and Grant's lifelong struggle with an early life diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Grant's an old friend of mine. This discussion went a lot deeper than even I expected. Uh, it's actually probably the heaviest episode of Crash and Ride so far. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope that you find something useful in it. I want to thank everybody for the feedback I've gotten so far. At the end of one of our recent episodes, I asked everybody to give me some input about whether this should be a one-a-week or two-a-week podcast. So far, the general consensus is that once a week is really good for everybody, so we're going to stay there for a while. I've got a bunch of episodes in the can. I can't wait to share them with you. Thanks again for everybody's support on our Patreon page. Uh, that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash crash and ride we've got some new monthly subscribers and we've had a couple of donations via our paypal uh i really appreciate it it's uh really keeping us going here crash and ride is now officially available on all the major podcast platforms you can listen to us on stitcher via apple podcasts on the google podcast network or via our patreon page as i mentioned before However, if you'd like to make a small monthly contribution to help us keep going, you have to do that on our Patreon page. You can sign up to contribute 5 or $10 monthly. That goes a long way towards covering our hosting expenses and, and also just to keep me going since this is my job other than playing drums in a rock band. While we're on that subject of my other job, Pinky Doodle Poodle recently played a show in Chattanooga, Tennessee, opening for a band called Daikaju, D-A-I-K-A-I-J-U. And it was one of the most exciting rock shows I have ever seen. I would highly encourage you if Daikaju is coming to your town to check them out. You can find their music and more about the band at daikaju.org. They're an explosive, uh, exciting surf rock band. I mean, it's kind of metal and kind of punk and kind of surfy and all instrumental and the drummer sets up in the middle of the audience and things get set on fire and people play on bars and get carried around by the audience at one point the the drummer and his drum kit were being held aloft by the audience and he kept playing and it was one of the most like Dionysian rock and roll experiences of my entire life and I've been doing this a long time so I would really encourage you to to go check them out and go see any local bands or any bands that come to your town because, you know, rock and roll is still a great way to make a lousy living, and I really would encourage you to get out there and see some bands. Speaking of that, my two main bands, 5-8 and Pinky Doodle Poodle, are going to do a short run of dates together starting Thursday, April 11th in Augusta at the Soul Bar. I've been playing at the Soul Bar since the 90s. I love playing there. It's a great place. I'm playing two sets. I'm playing with both 5-8 and Pinky Doodle Poodle that night. The following night, we're in St. Petersburg, Florida at a bar called The Bins. There are three bands on the bill that night, but I'm only going to play with two of them. And the night after that, Saturday, April 13th, we're playing in Gainesville, Florida at The High Dive. Sunday, we're going to drive home. And then Monday night, Pinky Doodle Poodle plays the Georgia Theater. Back here at home in Athens, we're playing the rooftop bar opening for the dynamic all-woman rock band from Nashville, Tennessee, Thelma and the Sleaze. I first saw them when I was playing drums in a band called The Powder Room. It's worth mentioning that all of the music you hear currently on Crash and Ride is from The Powder Room's first record called Curtains. Um, I didn't play on that record, but I've always loved it, and it's what drew me to the band. And I love their music so much that I've elected to use it pretty much exclusively on the podcast. All of The Powder Room's music uh, is available on Bandcamp at thepowderroom.bandcamp.com. The record that I played on is uh, up there. It's called Lucky. The cover of that record uh, features a picture of the van we were touring in uh, as it burns up. Uh, that happened on my first tour with the Powder Room. Kind of an amazing story. I talk about it more in an upcoming interview with Gus Angstrom, a promoter and musician from Charlotte, North Carolina, who's an old friend of mine, and we get into the details of the whole van fire uh, in that uh, interview. In the meantime, um, I think it's time to jump into our interview with Grant Curry. Okay, we're here with Grant Curry, a longtime friend of mine, uh, bass player for Pleasure Club, audio engineer and producer, fine art painter, basically uh, a renaissance man, I would say. Um, welcome, Grant. Thank you, Patrick. It's, it's great to have you here. Well, it's great to be here with you, and, and I appreciate very much you inviting me to be a part of this. It's, um, it's an honor to have you. Uh, Grant and I go way back, uh, almost 25 years 
easily to 1991. And when I met you, you were bass player uh, in Pleasure Club, uh, playing with James Hall and Sterling and Lynn Wright. Okay, I I actually wondered if I maybe knew you before I started playing with them. That's possible, but uh, I will never forget the first time that I saw you play with Five Eight. Was that a Howling Wolf? Tipitinas. Tipitinas. Was that Tipitinas? Oh man, that was the night Mike's wallet got stolen out of the dressing room. You guys were all incredibly sick. Yeah. <laughs> We were doing 200 to 220 shows a year then. So we were exhausted a lot of the time. And you, you, and you were extraordinary. <laughs> I remember that we weren't prepared for the level of heat and humidity in New Orleans. And we were all sick, yeah. And somehow I remember it being a somewhat transcendent show and then getting to the dressing room and discovering that Mike's wallet had been stolen. I believe you guys, I, I approached you that night. And I think that you guys came and stayed at my small yeah apartment yeah at least one of you stayed out probably mike stayed i think he stayed out in the van to protect the gear yeah well i mean new orleans is, was a different city then i was five eight fanboy for sure at that <laughs> point <laughs> you know you'd think that would be the last time mike's wallet got stolen out of the dressing room you'd think from then on he'd be like i'm just gonna have my wallet on stage with me because it's too risky <laughs> you'd think that we used to have the same issue with with Sterling Roy, uh, who who played drums in with uh, James Hall and and Lynn Wright and myself, and he had a way of of uh, not he didn't get things stolen. He just had a way of forgetting things and leaving stuff behind. I think every band has that guy. And his keys, wallets, everything, everything. Amazing. Somehow, we would then we would inevitably have to turn around and. You know, go back, drive back to whatever city it was, and oh. you know, an hour outside of town. And and uh, he always had good luck though, and would find his shit again. Turning around and going back though, I have a psychological thing with retracing my steps. It drives me insane. I hate being on the road, the driving part, and having to do it twice. Oh my god, makes me insane. But if you if you uh, if you take that idea of retracing your steps, it's certainly can be used as a as a metaphor for yeah. how we grow right yeah no yeah. that's definitely true um you were uh you're an engineering producer uh, you got your own room at madison studios in atlanta mm -hmm. you've got a bunch of cool projects that i've heard come out of there um particularly uh, i've enjoyed conda tell me about conda thanks yeah conda is a uh a jazz quartet atlanta based and uh that does uh uh, they play very much in the in the spirit of improvisational music, and uh, you know I I've been very guilty of of um, having a distaste and and even um, being you know, guilty of maybe uh, vocalizing in a not so friendly way about jam bands and sure unstructured music and. <clears throat> these guys just do it so well. I think they're a, so fluid with each other. Yeah. I mean, I think that the thing that I dislike about a lot of jam band music is not that it's improvisational, but that the improvisations are kind of lazy. Sort yeah. Of stuck in a pentatonic yeah. box. And, and yeah, it's either, it's either good or it's not good, I guess. And, and there's no, there's no rule to it. I, I these kind of guys are, are, they, you know, I mean, Conda is a reference to, I believe, one of the outtakes from the Miles Davis tribute to Jack Johnson record, which is my favorite Miles Davis record. Yeah. Um, and so they're, you know, they're 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 playing in the in the, you know, in the vein of of uh, you know, free jazz nineteen, you know, sixty eight to seventy two kind of thing i mean I, the first time i heard them i i thought that they were playing compositions like, because they were so uh they they were just so good together yeah and i and then it occurred to me midway through their set that they might be improvising and it turns out they were and uh i love their sound so much that i approached them and we developed a relationship and ended up making a record that came out last uh june and it's just it's just a gorgeous record we we spent uh an afternoon together in my studio had him play for about an hour took a half hour break and went back in for another hour and 
at the end of it, you know, realized we had a record and, and, uh, edited down and found the, you know, found the stuff that we really liked. And, uh, they've, uh, since, you know, they've, they've been working on, oh, they, they're all in a few different things as is yeah. the case with the, a lot of jazz musicians. Right. Anyways, I did, uh, did some recordings for the guitarist, Trey Donahue, that came out fantastic. Some compositional stuff of his. Uh-huh. Uh, he's, a, he's a marvelous writer. Uh, and you're playing with a couple of those guys. Yeah, too. I'm playing with Dallas Dawson, the drummer, and uh, Quinn Mason, the uh, tenor sax player in a project called the Duke Opera. And it uh, blends elements of free jazz with uh, ambience, trance, and... Uh, and my dub influences, and being that I don't, I'm not trained in jazz. I don't have, I don't speak that language. Right. It's a little intimidating for me working with guys like them. Uh, but it, the, our sound is really, is really interesting. I mean, I think that like a lot of the sort of this reminds me a little bit of the mission of Bill Laswell's label, and it sort of seems like mm-hmm. that that's always this sort of blend of like purely intuitive musicians with strongly theoretical musicians and then i've never really argued with the results i think that if it's good it's good i I agree and the the bill laswell is a great reference because i I may not necessarily like every bill laswell recording i've ever heard at at moments the stuff's a little slick for me but i have tremendous respect for him both as a producer and as an artist and you know the, the the stuff that he did uh, with, well, his project material that's been ongoing mm-hmm. for many years is, yeah. is, is, is really interesting. And then, um, uh, last exit yeah. was, it, yeah, yeah. it's just unbelievable. That's and, my favorite stuff. Um, with, you know, Sonny Chirac mm-hmm. and, uh, Bratzman and, um, oh my gosh, the, 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 the Texas, uh, drummer, um, uh, it, only one of the greatest d- drummers ever who, who right. just passed away a few years ago. But yeah. um, anyways, yeah. yes, I've been enjoying uh, uh, dipping my toes in, into yeah. into free jazz and, and uh, challenging myself there and playing a lot more fretless these days. It's a really different thing for me because, I, you know, I've been a rock bass, but an art rock bass player right. my, all my career. Yeah, so Pleasure Club uh, was a going concern for many years and then... You guys stopped playing, and now you've reunited. Uh, indeed. We uh, split up in, in spectacular fashion in 2005. Um, the only real way to break up. The, the only real way to go. Yeah. Um, right when we were we just released a record, and it was starting to get some traction mm-hmm. at radio, and uh, we were in heavy rotation at 99X, and... and, and Subsequent to that, some other stations uh, in the U.S. had picked picked up the single, and um, and then we just we just couldn't keep ourselves together because our our person interpersonal dynamic was so fractured and it and and you know. So, anyways, uh, yeah, we split up in two thousand five and all went our separate ways, and then uh, we got together last year for our first. We did, oh, I think four or five shows. Mm-hmm. First shows in, in 13 years, and uh, we was, released two new songs. It's my great pleasure to get to see one of those shows, and it was fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's talk about your early life a little bit. I, I, you're, you're from Louisiana originally, right? Uh, no, I'm not. Actually, yeah? I was born in Virginia. My, dad, my father was in the Navy, and uh, we were there about a year and a half, and then we moved to Hawaii, and we're there for about a year and a half, and... As my father was getting out of the Navy, we were in uh, upstate New York until, you know, it was pretty much junior high school on I was in Louisiana. Okay. So, you know, I was in, in uh, it was Rochester, New York. I was there for some formative years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't identify with it though as, yeah. as being where I'm from. I mean, I'm I'm surprised that I just always thought of you as a. When I met you, you were a full-on yat, like living <laughs> in New Orleans. Didn't take your coffee without chicory. And New Orleans worked very well for me, and I I felt and and if I, you know if I if I hadn't left there, I'd still 
still uh, be feeling very much at home and feeling like that was, you know, it feels like where I'm from. Um, I came to Atlanta in 2010. Uh, after the flooding of Katrina, I had some, I had some issues with, yeah. uh, well, issues with anxiety and, mm-hmm. uh, it, I couldn't stay there. I needed to move inland. Well, let's, we'll yeah. get to that. Um, you were touring heavily when you lived in New Orleans though. Yes. Uh, you were coming home to New Orleans and then eventually you built a studio at Ponchatoula. Mm-hmm. How long did you have that studio? I had that studio three years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was tremendous. It was great. It was out. It was on the Tangipahoa River, and um, we would take, you know, it was it, it, it was for my ex-wife and I, uh, you know, like a little weekend right. vacation spot. And, you know, at that point in Louisiana, you could, and, and during that time, you know, you could you could live for so cheap that you could afford to have a camp out, you know, on the bayou somewhere, you know. Yeah. Um, anyways, uh, this place was great, and so I had it. I installed a studio in the stec- second story of what was a essentially a glorified Acadian cottage, and mm. uh, we would take our breaks out on the back porch and watch the alligators swimming by, that kind of thing. Made some good records there. Thank you, thank you. Really had some had some great creative times there. Yeah, um, but my my sort of impression, and we've never really talked about this. Um, although as many years as we've been friends is that there was always this sort of shadow of depression and anxiety kind of hanging over your shoulder yeah. the whole time we've kind of known each other. Mm-hmm. Did that start in childhood or? Yes, it did. Yeah. Uh, I would identify it, uh, having started when I was eight, uh, in 1975, the year I was diagnosed with my, uh, type one diabetes. How long did it take them to diagnose that? Well, not thankfully, not too terribly long because my mother had a grandmother who lived with diabetes, and so she was somewhat familiar with some symptoms. of the symptoms. And yeah. so I ended up in the hospital pretty quickly yeah. with the diagnosis. Yeah, and um, that's not a easy diagnosis for a kid to get. Like you're going to be different, and your life might be shorter and all these terrible things they tell. There's no, nothing you need to be telling an eight year old, but my understanding from the conversations we've had about this is they didn't, they didn't hold back at all on you, didn't they? No, I sure didn't. I mean, that, you know, back then the, the uh, the, there, there weren't any of the, the, the modern uh, tools that we have now for diabetes management, home blood testing didn't exist. Right. Uh, we didn't have, um, we didn't have, fast you know rapid acting insulins uh the insulin that was available then was uh you know wasn't always stable it was it was terribly unstable in in temperatures far more so than uh than now and insulin pumps weren't being widely used at the time they were still in development yeah. uh uh, we didn't have glucose sensors. Uh, so anyways, you know, I, I call it the dark age of diabetes. Um, yeah. Anyways, the uh, the challenges of, of living with diabetes were just tremendous. And, and, you know, no, it's not, it wasn't easy as a kid, but it's also, it's not easy when, uh, you know, someone's diagnosed with di- type 1 diabetes as an adult, you know, and there's... Yeah. Diabetes people living with diabetes, and this is this is a a uh, this is a fact here that are far more prone to uh, living with depression. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it, and uh, certainly just the all the the mental challenge of it, but also uh, the way that blood sugars impact right mood, the mood, yeah, and such sense of well being, yeah. Mm-hmm. So at a very early age, you're sort of handed this like chronic condition you you have to manage. Yes. And. And I managed very poorly for for a number of years. I've uh, I've I've seen that with other people who were diabetic, especially when I was younger, as you, during the dark ages, as you just referred to them, people just eating badly, not monitoring their blood sugar, just out of almost pure self destructive. A, like a desire to to just not not deal with it. I wouldn't say it's a desire to not deal with it. I think it's it's more just 
being crushed by the enormity of it. I, that's what it was for me. Yeah. I mean, did I, I wasn't avoiding doing my urine testing uh, because, just because I thought it was a pain, you know, or because I wanted to be rebellious. I avoided it because it was terrifying to see what the results were going to be. Yeah. You know, and when the results didn't come out desirable, it frightened me. And I thought about all these things that, that you already referenced, you know, I'm going to die young. I'm going to have limbs amputated. I'm going to have kidney failure. I'm going to go blind. Um, you know, as a, as an eight year old, you know, starting to worry about, uh, being impotent, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, was, it was awfully early to be thinking yeah. about all these, these things, you yeah. know, and I was told that my life expectancy was probably to uh, about 65 years. And if, thankfully, thankfully, those numbers are starting to change quite dramatically because of the way that type 1 diabetes is treated today. And because yeah. of the tools we have, life expectancy is considerably longer. Um, and I expect to live quite a bit longer than, than yeah. the 65. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're fucking kicking ass now. Well, thanks, man. I work yeah. really hard at it, actually. And it's uh, every day is a challenge. And uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, really thankful both to have the tools and also to have, a, you know, I've got a network, man. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole underworld of diabetes. And we stick together. And it's great to be connected yeah. with people and uh you know i've got an incredible medical team and and i i know pretty well what i'm doing these days so yeah. um but you know the the this isn't you know our conversation today isn't centered on musicians with diabetes right but that said the diabetes figures very heavily into my life with depression yes. and anxiety so you've got this sort of existential threat at a very young age and I'm sure that that manifested itself as a lot of um, anxiety and, and fear as you kind of grew into adolescence. Um, did you find that um, <clears throat> the music was a coping tool? Doug, when did you first start playing music? I first started playing music. Uh, my first instrument was a cello. Yeah. In fourth grade. And I loved it. I loved the feel of the strings in my my left hand and the bow in my right and and I just unfortunately didn't stay with it very long because I had a teacher who was grumpy and impatient you know um bad music teachers well, yeah short a lot of careers yeah so um and I quickly moved to guitar because I had heard the Beatles and decided I you know that's I've got to be like the Beatles and um yeah, a, music was music was an incredible uh, respite for me. Do you have a favorite Beatle? John. Yeah. Unquestionably. I was going to yeah. guess John. Yeah. Yeah. Temperamentally, I'm John. But in, musically, it, it's all Ringo for me. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, John was dark. You were a dark teenager. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. Did you go to college? I did. Uh... Yeah, it was probably one of the biggest mistakes of my life, really. Um, this was it wasn't the place where I was gonna thrive and, and flourish. It didn't it just didn't didn't work for me. I I went a year to L S U and was miserable and, and yeah. depressed and felt like a fish out of water and Where was your family living when you left to go to LSU? Slidell, Louisiana. Yeah, so you yeah. were sort of hometown, not too far away. Yeah, about an hour and a half. Uh, one of the things I've we've talked about a couple times on this podcast was the number of opportunities that just go flying by uh, depressive people because we're just not ready. Well, you or know, even I, suited I think, for the thing. Sure, know. and I and I I think that I hadn't yet really found my I hadn't found my gift with music. Yeah. And so you, um, you weren't playing when you were at LSU. I, um, I was playing, you know, I was just tinkering around, but I, I just I never took myself seriously. You know, I growing up playing guitar, it was just it was nothing but noise to my parents, and they like most parents would, you know, think that they don't want their kids to become 
rock musicians it's another discussion. because there's no security yeah. we keep you know having no on future this, in that on the show is that when we were teenagers the career path for a rock and roll musician was discovered accidentally uh fame and riches death at 27 and that was the sort of lore you know abandonment of all that is pure and holy in your life and uh, an embrace of the uh heroin and the void and then death and so my parents I had to hide my drum kit from you know my mom was really adamantly against it and i'm sure your parents were just like no way buddy yeah and they they you know i remember hearing plenty of times like look you know you got to be really good to make it as a musician and so that felt like oh well i guess i'm i'm not terribly good yeah. so i you know i never i never i don't think i just i never took myself too seriously with it but i loved it i loved it i loved it and you know i was I, it was a. It was also a vehicle for my my anger. I had yeah. so much rage as a as a kid growing up, feeling different and and feeling like crap every day. Right. You know. Um, I mean, that's a thing that a lot most people don't realize about living with diabetes is just how volatile it can be day to day. And even for somebody like myself who who works really hard to manage it, um, you know, still. I mean, I go through you know the day. And my 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 blood sugars may be rising or falling or going outside of my targeted range, and I'm not feeling well. Well, as a kid, not having an insulin pump, not having a glucose sensor, not being able to do home blood testing, I felt like crap all the time. So I was pissed. So you're just taking like regularly scheduled injections of insulin, whether they're on time or needed or not. Right in a in a pre-prescribed amount, regardless of how much I was eating or exercising, all that. So. Um, it, yeah, it just didn't go well, and I didn't feel good, and I found it frustrating. You know, I was I was an athletic kid, and I loved sports, and uh, I but I couldn't I couldn't do it as well as I wanted to because of the diabetes. I just felt crushed, yeah. just crushed by my diabetes, and I was pissed about it. And so you know I this you know the same year that I was diagnosed with my diabetes is also the same year that I started drinking alcohol. Yeah, eight. Yeah. Uh. You know, and then I was, you know, into other drugs by the time I was 11. Mm-hmm. And is this uh, in Slidell? Uh, or upstate New York? Well, it started in upstate New York and then and then carried on into Slidell. And uh, I ended up in uh, a treatment center for uh, adolescent drug addicts uh, by the time I was 14. Wow. That's an early... Um early bottom yeah i was you know i was hitting i was hitting bottom about when everyone else was starting to <laughs> starting to drink beers on the weekends the 78 rpm yeah it was uh, it was it was pretty well accelerated but i you know, yeah. i was in a lot of pain and yeah and uh the pain was so intense and the you know the the chemicals blunted the pain yep feelings are hard it's a, i mean it's a real simple equation there yeah yeah was there a, a was there a period of time there where you contemplated self-harm at all yes i mean i i remember i, I can't i can't remember exactly what age but i remember from a very young age uh contemplating hurting myself and and wishing i that having that feeling of wishing i wasn't alive Mm-hmm. because I didn't want to continue to bear the way that I felt. And, I mean, I, I do remember starting to do some cutting when I was 12-ish, yeah. Ish, yeah. Um, I, I remember having suicidal ideation at 11, 12. And you were just cowboy in this you didn't talk to adults about it or see a doctor or anything uh well you know i i was i was so angry and temperamental um i was having you know it's just a regular thing in my house that i was you know going into rampages and and yeah i think just uh, generally speaking i was emotionally unstable and I mean, I would just simply say I, I was angry. Yeah. And I was expressing it, you mm-hmm. know. Yeah. But 
to everybody outside me i was i was i was just not a control kid and so yeah i started seeing child uh, psychologists and psychiatrists from a really young age yeah i think i don't know i think probably not long after i was diagnosed with my diabetes yeah you know but it was always under the context of like yeah well grant's not he's he's a problem he's he's not behaving well yeah please fix him right not grant has some needs that aren't being met yeah grant needs grant needs to talk about the feelings he's having right about the challenges that he's got so you land in treatment at 14 and you've been and and i was i was locked in you know i was right. it was not a this was not a voluntary palm thing. springs betty Ford. no it certainly wasn't and, and yeah. i wasn't happy to be there yeah yeah and and i was also that was it's not, it wouldn't be too dramatic for me to be saying that i was almost dead yeah i was really sick yeah. Well, you weren't maintaining. I mean, you have this the double barrel threat of of substances and of just lack of self care with your blood sugar. Yeah, that could do you in pretty quick. Indeed. So, and, but treatment at fourteen, um, and you've been substance free since. Am I correct about that? No, I have. Yeah. Yeah. But. My in my own experience, with recovery is that just getting off the drugs didn't really. I didn't start acting right for a long time. <laughs> no, I didn't act right for a long time. Yeah. Um, but that was you know that was the start, and I you know yeah. I got clean, and you know I spent you know, I spent several months in the hospital, and uh, both you know kind of going through the you know, rehabilitation program, and you know getting my health stabilized my physical health stabilized a little bit and then i went on to uh to live in a halfway house for i don't know six eight months and what ages is this i'm still 14 i think i think maybe i turned 15 while i was in the halfway house i think part of what obstructed me getting sort of the thing that stood between me and being happy when i was sort of in the same place when i was that age was that um all the adults around me's idea of me being fixed didn't jibe with my idea of what I wanted for my life. And so when they would say, we want you to do A, B, C, D, and E and get better, I would think, I don't want any of those things. You know, I, I don't want to lose my self-identity, but it was so closely identified with rage at that point that I didn't really have an idea of how I wanted to be when I got better. So it really prolonged for me the bad behavior for a long time. Yeah. Because a lot of the adults in my life just wanted to control my behavior. I mean, I don't know if that parallels your... Sure. Yeah. So you eventually finished high school, one year at LSU, playing music this whole time, right? At least as a hobby. Yeah. And then you drop out and move to New Orleans then? Um, So I, I had started... A career in chemical dependency counseling. Yeah, and I didn't know that. I I worked in that field for I don't know three four years. It was starting when I was nineteen, mm-hmm. and I was I was almost uh, I was soon to be getting my my national board certification in substance abuse counseling and. I had a caseload of my own. I was working for a hospital in Slidell, Louisiana, and uh, I think I was pretty good at it. Um, but I wasn't happy doing it. Yeah, you know, I was doing it because it's what I knew, and then I, you know, I'd been been eating, sleeping, breathing chemical dependency and chemical dependency recovery since I was eight. Mm-hmm. You know. Um, it was familiar, and I guess I was also, you know, if I was good at it, it was because I I was able to exhibit a certain sensitivity to the world around me, and mm-hmm. and um, strong sense of empathy, certainly. Yeah. Uh, and you know, also, I, I credit that to the challenges that I grew up with. Yeah. You know, I people. Uh, 
I don't, people tell me that they see me as, as somebody who who is is able to empathize well and that's a good friend and you know if I'm any kind of a good friend or a good human being I attribute that to to growing up with diabetes really yeah and you know people say well you know you've been able to do all these amazing things in spite of it I'm like no I've been able to do all these amazing things because of it right you know and you know my uh my stepson, he's 17 now. Gibson asked me probably five years ago. He said, if if there was a cure for diabetes, would you take it? And you know, it it it, it was a startling question for me, and. You know, so it kind of stopped me dead in my tracks, and I had to think about it. Mm-hmm. And my response to him was that, yeah, I would, mm-hmm. but I, I would also probably get in the back of the line. And, you know, I realized, you know, I got to thinking about that. Like, why, why did I why did I have to think, why did I have to consider that, you know? And I realized that I had reached, obviously, a point in my life where I, well, one, I was able to manage it and, and, you know, live with it reasonably. And, and, but I also, I knew that it had made me, it helped shape me into the person that I am. Right. It made you a better person. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I didn't grow up with all the with 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 all the biases and and prejudices that that I see so many people growing up with, mm-hmm. because I was different. I was an oddball, and so you know, and I was the underdog. I was broken. You know, I felt so fundamentally broken, uh, and I don't know. I was just able to see other people as just being unique, and so. Uh, Gibson's question to me just was so, the moment was so profound for me. And I had this feeling of, of being thankful for, for my diabetes, for the depression, the anxiety that I've been challenged with, the drug addiction, you name it, because, because it had given me so many gifts. Yeah. And so many friends that I met through yeah. all these challenges. That's, um, you know, we talk about gratitude and this secret society that keeps me off drugs. Um, and sometimes it's hard to get a hold of the thing that sort of recognizing that, yeah, I can't do a lot of the things that other people can do, but it's given me this stronger sense of empathy and and a sense of responsibility for my own well-being too. Yeah. Yeah, so. So when did you sort of transition out of the rehab counseling and into playing music professionally? Oh, right. Um was <laughs> so uh that would have been when I was 22, 23. Mm-hmm. I just reached a point where I, I was spending all my evenings over at this buddy of mine's trailer in Slidell, yeah, uh, playing music and so something he was a guitar good player. has started in a trailer in right. Slidell. Yes, so indeed. <laughs> that's the indeed. exception that makes the rule that there nothing is, good starts. There, no, there is <laughs> magic to be found in trailers, and in fact, I transitioned to bass in a trailer. Yeah, and it was several years before that when I was in my teens. I'd been invited to come over and jam with these guys that I knew uh, that were also in 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 recovery, and they needed uh, their their bass player wasn't around on this particular day, and so can you come play bass? I'm like, yeah, sure, you know, I'm sure I can do that. It's like a a guitar minus the difficulty, right? Right. And so, uh, 
<laughs> so, um, anyways, uh, I, I, I just fell in love with the bass that day, and I was, wow, this is this is amazing the, the way that this feels, the way that the, yeah. the air behind me, you know, feels coming from the oh, the man, speaker cabinet. I'm, it's just I, I'm mm, terrible at it, but I love playing bass. It's just the best, and so I uh, and I also found that I, I was far more expressive uh, with it than I was with guitar and all my years of being frustrated, you know, not feeling like, why doesn't this work for me? Why don't, you know, why doesn't this make the kind of sense to me? Like, it feels like it should. I've been, I've been practicing and playing with well, a bass made sense to me and I felt right. right. And that was it. So anyways, I was, you know, spending all my evenings, uh, playing, playing music over my buddy's trailer and, uh, We'd get this like stack of, of speaker cabinets, you know, with guitar, bass, and then we'd send a drum machine through the stuff, and and it was a really incredible time. Mm -hmm. uh, Did, was there a band out of this, or was it just a loose? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Did, uh, did they gig? Was there any? Gigs? No, no, no. But we played in his trailer and in Bob's trailer, and his his boy Bobby and his his uh, his two daughters. Rachel and Rochelle mm -hmm. would fall asleep on the couch listening to this racket. <laughs> and little Bobby loved it. And yeah. he wanted to he wanted to be like us, you know. And mm -hmm. uh so that it was just I don't know, it was a powerful time. And 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 now we were writing songs together and um playing the music we were playing was was very uh Minutemen. Oh, cool! Fire hose, yeah, yeah, uh, inspired, and um, really just raw, unpolished, and um, and then Bobby passed away. Uh, oh no! Bobby, Bobby, uh, Bobby died in a in a in a an accident that that resulted in a uh, fatal uh, head injury, and. Um, that was a really, really tough time. Uh, and I remember going into a very deep depression following that. Uh, car, car accident? Uh, no, he actually, he was, it was, it was, uh, he hit his head on some, uh, on a cement slab um, from a fall. And, oh, that boy was so dear. Uh, I loved him so much. And, and he left behind three kids? He, uh, so his, well, you know, his, Bobby was eight when he died. His father is still. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah. It's Bob. Yeah, yeah. Bobby. Yeah. So yep. little Bobby is mm -hmm. who passed. Mm -hmm. Yep. His, 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 yeah. So his dad and, and his two sisters, his twin sisters, um, they are an outstanding family. They're really great people that I still keep up with. Yeah. And anyways, uh, I, I have Bob to thank though for, pursuing music professionally because he was the one who really pushed me you know you got to get out of this you know, this counseling racket you know your heart's really in music and anyways i had this opportunity i got i got an opportunity to take a voluntary layoff from the hospital i was working with and that meant i could you know i could get on unemployment, unemployment. insurance and so right. i jumped on it and decided i would spend you know and i moved into new orleans and i decided i'm gonna i'm gonna spend all my time searching for like-minded musicians to play with and long story short i eventually saw james and lynn playing a gig at the old rc bridge lounge and one night and and it was incredible and it just blew my mind and and what i heard them doing was what was what you know the stuff that was in my heart and in my head and they were just performing as a duo uh they had a drummer that night who was just keeping time mm -hmm. um but it was uh, it was it was incredible, and and so I eventually met James and and Lynn, and we started playing together, and it was a pretty instant chemistry. Yeah, yeah. And so, anyways, I'm I'm in this really deep depression during this time. Yeah, after the death of Bobby. Yeah, after the death of Bobby, and then you know my moving from Slidell, and and you know big big changes in life, whatever. I'd mm -hmm. also gone through. Uh, there was some big, uh, now there's a lot of emotional upheaval within my family and, and death of a grandfather and, and, and my 
grandmother uh also going into a rehab facility and it's just the whole the, the whole family was just fucked up at the time right. and, and and that was I think uh, you've mentioned this grandma before she wasn't really a warm person no she wasn't she was she was yeah. she was nasty she was awful and she was yeah. awful to my mother and I witnessed this and um mm. uh, she was manipulative with me and and kind of had me um in this really really unhealthy um mediation you know position between her and my mom yeah. for many many years and yeah. um she was an alcoholic herself as was my grandfather so anyways um i'm in this really dark dark spot and yet i'm playing music and i'm I, i'm barely able to sustain myself financially yes and i'm more fulfilled and uh, I guess, you know, I mean, you can't say I was happy. I wasn't, I, you know, it was, it, was, it really was a tough time, but I just, I felt, I felt like I was going to get through it because I had music and I had these, well, these colleagues that I was, that I was playing music. There's with. a difference between happy and having a will to live, but having a will to live for some of us is a step up from where we usually are. I had the will to live during that time. Right. I certainly did, and I I was trying very hard to get out of that 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 funk. depression, that yeah. funk, and all. I mean, I, and I, you know, at this point, I had started taking medication, antidepressant mm -hmm. medication, and, I, and it was incredibly helpful for me. I know what, that's not the story for everybody. Well, what years was this? Nine, uh, Ninety, yeah, ninety two, ninety one, ninety two. So early Zoloft, right? This is when they're sort of dialing that in for the yeah, first time. Yeah. Um, I didn't take Zoloft. Or not Zoloft. Prozac. Um, this is Prozac, yeah. yeah. You know, and look, Prozac has like been awful for a lot of people, but I took right. Prozac for a time and it worked really well for me. And but I, I don't I'm not, you know, I, I'm not the judge and the jury for for who all that's right for, but right. for me it it helped me to feel um I think to feel normalized, you know, like, I think so these are whenever I had experiences, well, absolutely. And, yeah. and like, you know, if issues that would come up in my life, it helped for the, the molehills to stay right. Molehill sized not, and not become mountains, you know, it, it helped to keep things from being inappropriately amplified the way that right. depression will do for us or yeah. the way anxiety will do for us. Yeah. So you found a doctor and, and he's prescribing Zoloft or, or Prozac at that time is that what you were doing? Yeah, and boy was that a relief because, you know, I I think I I probably could have benefited from uh, being on antidepressant medication, you know, years before. And um, in fact, you know, later on, I I resented the fact that I was that my that my depression wasn't properly diagnosed when I was in treatment for uh, for my drug addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, because um, it just felt like shit, man. I could have been. I could have been feeling normal yeah. at all for all these these years past. Um, so yeah, I you know I got got on that and 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 uh, realized that I could I could go through depressions and still still function, function. and and, yeah. and still uh, you know pursue my passion. You've been staying on those same meds. Is it the same? No, no. I've I've switched meds since then. Um, you know, I've I've been on Prozac at different times since then. You know, periodically because yeah. the Prozac's pretty powerful, and and yeah. um, I mean, it would, it's more than what I what I need right now. You know, mm -hmm. I stay on a you know a, a maintenance you know dose of uh, Wellbutrin. Yeah, is, is what I've been on for I guess about fifteen. Yeah, about fifteen, sixteen years now, and it's it's worked beautifully for me it's hard to argue with the results i mean you've been incredibly successful artistically and you're happily married now and like you know there's people who will argue like oh, i don't want to fuck with meds because it'll change my personality I'm like well number one you don't seem that happy now <laughs> you know when people right. say that i'm always like oh. yeah but I, I, it did you know that's just not been my experience it doesn't yeah. change my personality it allows me to have my natural personality mm -hmm. and you know i there's a i know a lot of people out there are anti psychotropic meds, meds yeah. and um well i mean most of those people haven't really 
I mean, my observation anyways is most of them haven't properly experienced, you know, major depressive disorder and haven't taken medications to climb out of it. And it's easy yeah. to scapegoat meds for, you know, some of the other bad behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So you met James, you start playing with him mm -hmm. and you guys, um, it was kind of a whirlwind for a while there. Yeah. Well, and so here, here's, here's a cool thing. I mm -hmm. had... When I left my job at Slido Memorial Hospital mm -hmm. doing as a chemical dependency counselor, I decided, I, and, it, and it, was a, it was a real deliberate, you know, thought yeah. that I had. I am going to have a life in the arts, being creative at any cost. It's what I have to do. It's what I'm happiest doing. I'm most at peace doing. And I'm going to do it, whatever it takes, okay? So I make that decision, and I uh, just throw myself into it. And, and, you know, eventually I got, I had to get a, you know, I had to get a job. It was not quite full-time, but um, got a job, uh, you know, hustling Oriental rugs. And, and um, that just, allowed, that afforded me, you know, my, my, my passion and mm -hmm. every evening was rehearsals or going out to see music and being inspired by the stuff that I was seeing. And, and I just never looked back. I mean, that was it. That's what I knew yeah. I wanted to do. And I just decided it, you know, if I don't, if I don't pursue what I'm most passionate about, I, eventually I, I probably will blow my brains out. Yeah. Well, yeah. Stopping is something that every musician I know is considered at some point. I did it for two years and ended up, you know, I didn't have a nervous breakdown, but I had a breakdown. Like I was in the, I've talked about this before on the show. I had a, was in Publix at two o'clock in the morning and the song came on the intercom and I just started just bawling, uh, mourning the loss of my life as an artist I'd been off it for, I'd stopped playing for like two years at that point and, and realized right then that I was not going to be able to be happy if I didn't play. So James, uh, the pleasure club, you guys did a lot of fucking crazy stuff. You opened for rage against the machine, right? Mm -hmm. In the UK mm -hmm. and, um, played some festivals and, and did some heavy touring. Um, but eventually in 2005, yeah, you guys went your separate ways. Yeah, we went our separate ways, and at that point, I was doing more. Uh, you know, I just started doing more studio stuff. I had my studio, and I started producing uh, some bands. And I, there's a band out of Brooklyn that I that I found that that I really liked, and had them down for a few weeks. And we made a record right before Hurricane Katrina. And oh, there was an artist out of Milwaukee that I. Mm -hmm. uh, that who, I got to these, know uh, Liv Mueller from uh, Milwaukee and mm -hmm. her band at the time the Dark Horse Project and then uh, other passengers in Brooklyn and they were a, they were a bit of a cross between Pink Floyd and Fugazi uh, <laughs> okay. really 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 good and really interesting band but ultimately they were just you know as a as a you know, as a group, they were just really fucked up, and they didn't last very long. They they yeah. did put out that record though that we made together, um, and I, it was my first full production. You know, where I engineered, uh, produced, and mixed, and I'm still very proud of it. Um, mm -hmm. And you know, I so I was, I was working with you know with a few different people, and uh, wasn't making a whole lot of music of my own up until I guess 2000. 2006 2007 and i got back together with lynn wright who had played guitar right you know with with james Pleasure club yeah and um we made a record under the name ballroom dance is dead and that mm -hmm. was uh instrumental very dubby very trancy yeah uh a piece of work that i will always be proud of uh, is, is that available anywhere yeah yeah you oh, can find it um you no, there's no van, band camp page but you can find it uh, through Amazon, you can sure. get it on iTunes. I mean, I think you can still actually get uh, CD hard copies of it. Okay. Um, so we did that, and then Lynn uh, did what was effectively a, a solo, his first solo record, and we recorded that at my place in Ponchatoula. Um, 
that was uh, a, that was a really creative time, actually. That was great, and 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 you know, I was learning, you know, the art of recording during all that. And and my mm-hmm. friend Ethan Allen had mentored me through that. Uh, Ethan, who had been the he'd been house engineer at uh, Kingsway Studios in New Orleans, you know, with yeah. Dan Lanois and yeah, Malcolm we, Byrne, and Five Eight almost Howard. recorded at Kingsway, and mm-hmm. it, that whole thing fell apart. It was really frustrating. I was really stoked to, to play in that old house and and make a record there, and then it didn't happen. It was kind of a drag. Yeah, you know, in in all my years there, I never stepped foot in Kingsway. I don't I don't know how I managed to skip that, but um, yeah, uh, that was too bad. I wish I had because uh, I know it was it was a pretty magical place for a lot a, of people. There was a fucking banana tree by the hot tub, <laughs> and they would like grow bananas, and then when they were ripe, like they would make banana daiquiris and stuff like, you know it, it, it my my ex-wife and i the home we had over in algiers point we had a banana tree no in the shit. backyard and uh that yielded a lot of fruit and um i would i i'd uh i'd put the bananas in a skillet with some cinnamon and yeah whatnot you know it was just great i i I sometimes wonder why i don't live somewhere where you can grow bananas and mangoes but man it was um every every new orleanian i know's life is divided into pre and post katrina yeah so what happens yeah so um so there's as you know there's there's some pieces to this that I'm I'm just not I'm just not comfortable talking about you know that. and I have to I have to respect you know the privacy of my ex-wife and uh but yeah we life was falling apart for us and mm-hmm. and our marriage was falling apart and and uh we had we had decided to move leave louisiana and and it was a it was a it was a painful decision to arrive at but um i uh i just i couldn't live with you know we always had evacuation bags packed you know and and yeah. sitting in the corner in the guest room and and i just couldn't live like that anymore always you know being ready to go and it seems like katrina shook a lot of people's uh, faith that that they were, were in good hands in the in the sort of in the care of the Louisiana and New Orleans sort of governments, like oh, there's a possibility we're just going to get fucking abandoned, and so people's sort of yeah, yeah, there was that, and then just the the um, I mean, you know, with the the Gulf waters just continuing to get warmer and warmer there's there's going to be more and more strong hurricanes coming into the gulf of mexico and we were having to evacuate you know once a year and it just it was just a nightmare and so anyways i i didn't feel safe there anymore now i didn't i just didn't feel safe in general and i started having a lot of anxiety and and i was I was having to you know, watch my back more than ever before, just walking down the street. And, yeah, New and, Orleans could be a little wacky. Yeah, and yeah. Um, so, anyways, we moved and and so you make a decision to move to somewhere, and then you decide in Athens, Georgia. We decided on Athens, and we knew we wanted to stay in the South, and um, we knew it needed to be inland. You know, right. so and then you we, had this catastrophic health event. Yeah, so I had a an accident on a bicycle and a major injury that followed. Um, you know, broke my hip and in the in the, in the worst fracture you can imagine, and, and basically busted the knob right off. Uh, the hip yeah, plate. and yeah. Um, you know, six days before the moving truck was supposed to be coming to get us and and uh, take us from New Orleans, and um, so and then i i had a I had a cardiac event while I was in the hospital following the hip surgery, and that was terrifying and. Um, and so arrived, you know, in Athens in a, in a wheelchair and couldn't walk for three months and, Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like I said, our marriage was falling apart and, you know, here we are in a new place and, um, you're basically Jimmy Stewart in rear window. 
<laughs> yes. And life is happening all around you and not good things. So no, we're going to get through this, yeah. Yeah, and your anxiety level is just sky high. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I... Uh, and then there, you know, and then there, there was, you know, like I said, as you know, there were some really difficult other things that were going sure. on during that time. And, and, uh, and then I, and then I, you know, that ended up being like one of the worst years of my life. Cause it, I mean, it's just one thing on top of another and, you know, leaving, leaving my home, uh, that I loved and my marriage falling apart and it eventually ending up in divorce and, having a major injury and not being able to walk for a while and um, you know, some of the health challenges that went along with that, with my diabetes. And then I had, um, I had, I do have some complications as a result of living with diabetes for now 43 years. And I had, um, I've had musculoskeletal issues primarily. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I do have, I have uh, retinopathy, eye disease, but um, that my hands, uh, oh, oh, oh shit, I've had, I think I've had like I don't know, 12 or 13 surgeries now and, and, and my hands, I've had seven or eight of them, you know, and then my mm-hmm. shoulders as well. And so I had hand surgeries following the, the, the hip injury and, and just, like I said, one thing after another, I lost four pets all that year that that were really, really dear to me. And, and, uh, you know, I, I, I've told you this before and, and whenever your name comes up in, in conversation with other people, you know, I, I always say, you know, Patrick Ferguson saved my life and you, uh, you know, for anybody listening to this, you know, it, you know, it was a, although it was, it was one of the hardest times of my life, it was also really extraordinary because of the friendship that I, you know, that I already had with you and that uh, the way that we connected. And when I arrived from, from the first day that I arrived in Athens and there'd been a snowstorm, yeah, you, you started coming over every day on, on your lunch break and you'd pick me up at my house and literally pick me up yeah. <laughs> and carry me to carry your car stairs yeah carry me down the stairs uh and at, at that time like walking down the you know an ice covered you know walkway um and you'd put me in in your car and you'd take me out for you know coffee or lunch and just to get me out of the house and yeah, you because know, you knew I was having such a hard time, and you and yeah. you brought me to the studio that you were working at, and you got me involved, and we did some mixes together. Yeah. And uh, and then you know later that year when my you know when my marriage you know had ended and and we were separated, I uh, you you had me come live in your home. Oh, that's right. I, for I actually for three weeks. That you lived there. Yeah. Yeah. I I won't forget that. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I lived with you for three weeks and, yeah. and you and Lisa took care of me and I, just, I knew you were in a tunnel and I, and that's even like as good as things get, as we take care of ourselves and we get better, we can still go into a fucking tunnel sometimes. And yeah. I wasn't going to abandon a, a dear friend in the tunnel, you know? And, and, and I'll always know that, Yeah, you know? So I have, I have that to help me through you know maybe future challenging times that i might go through you know i i i that was uh, that probably was the most challenging time in my life then and the i developed uh generalized anxiety disorder and somewhat of a i guess i was probably experiencing some level of ptsd at that point and um, you know, and there's a couple other little pieces that are missing here that uh, other things that happened. And, yeah. um, I mean, I was just scared. I was scared to go out in public. I was scared to walk down the, when I eventually did start walking again, I was scared to walk down the sidewalk cause I was afraid of, you know, getting hit by the, to go out on a bike. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, roller blade or something. Yeah. You get this tender hip with a pin in it. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, 
uh and yeah you might remember too at one point i was like fuck this man i can't i can't live my life being afraid and i and i bought a I bought a skateboard <laughs> 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 and and you know i was in skateboarding when i was a kid so i bought this like retro you know uh sims okay. um reissue uh sims pure juice board and and the first time i got on it i almost ran myself i was going downhill and i forgot oh shit these don't have brakes and i almost right. went into a car and instead had to take a hard left and 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 hit the side of a dumpster um <laughs> so it was just a bad idea um anyways um that that whole year was just things were a mess and uh my depression was was terrible and and uh and my anxiety just kept growing and growing and i got to the point where i was having a hard time um uh even just like going into restaurants and stuff and i'd have i'd be you know like going out to eat and i was eating alone much of the time too because i i lasted in athens two years and then it just wasn't working for me and so i moved into atlanta and and i i i was spending a lot of time alone way too much time alone and i'd drive around to like go you know get dinner and and look for a place to eat and i'd have to case the joint you know drive the block a few times and make sure there was a table that was near the door in case I had to run out fast, you know, and right. I always, I, I just found myself always having to have an escape route, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, uh, you know, I start, I got into some therapy, um, and, and, you know, I've been in, like I said, I've been in therapy since I was very young and, and, and all through these years, uh, you know, right. kind of in and out of therapy as needed. And, and I'm so a, cognitive you know, behavioral therapy. Yeah, it's, or, I yeah. mean, just, you know, I've done all kinds of therapy, and, right. and therapy's been great for me. It really has. And um, so I was, I was in some, uh, I was seeing seeing a, a therapist in Atlanta, and I was doing a, a a couple different things actually at that time. I was doing kind of general talk therapy as well as mm-hmm. doing um, yoga for anxiety with mm-hmm. a you know with a licensed uh, uh, therapist who also was licensed in in yoga practice and then i was also doing um emdr you know which is a not yeah um you know a, a therapy technique used uh well it was used a lot for 9-11 yeah uh survivors one of and my best friends is in the middle of that right now war veterans and yeah. um and people who have you know experienced any type of you know trauma, uh, trauma. Yeah. and that was incredibly helpful for me uh and I was actually started cutting uh, myself again during that time, which um, I don't know if I ever shared with you. No, and I didn't and know that. and in fact, I, I, you know, I mean, this was you know, this was 2011 um, and 12. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm embarrassed about it. You know, I feel ashamed about it like that. But I, you know, I, yeah, I was I started doing that again, and and and. And that was that was really intense because I, I I was able to really identify what it was about it that worked. Why was I doing it? You know. Yeah. I mean, I remember at one Tell point having that. a having a you know having a uh, taking an eight inch kitchen knife, mm-hmm. uh, chef's knife, you know, across my abdomen and across my chest. And seeing the blood coming out, and, you know, and these weren't deep wounds, you know, mm-hmm. but just deep enough to, you know, to to draw blood, and realizing, like, this this feels better than I was feeling a minute ago when I wasn't doing this. There's a relief in this. You think that's an endorphin thing from the pain? Or just a, ten, I, you a, a know, I suppose it could be, but I, I actually think it's because I was able to focus on right. making the cut and not be focused on the pain that I was feeling and all the, uh, you know, all the, 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 the difficult things that were going on in my life at the time. It was a moment of relief. Now, I, I don't want to, this may sound really superficial, but I'm really curious about this question. At this time, were you playing any music? Okay, so well, that's a great question because I too had a, about a two-year break yeah. where I wasn't playing music, and and it was during that time. Yeah. Yes, 
and um, and I wasn't doing it. You know, I had started uh, painting in 1997, um, and was was you know doing acrylics and oils on canvas, but then eventually moved to ink on paper, and that's really my my preferred visual medium. And I I, I love I love working with ink and paper and. Um, so I, I, I had been doing a lot of that and then, you know, stopped, um, when, you know, life just, you know, all this crap just took over yeah. and, uh, it was almost like my, my creative energy just you know, like I couldn't access it. And, um, so yeah, there was a two year period where I wasn't and, uh, I mean, there was little bits and pieces, like, like I said, you, you brought me in to help you mix a couple songs and yep. then you asked me to mix an album f- yep. that you had just produced yep. uh and recorded and and that was great for me um but i i still wasn't i wasn't doing it all with regularity and i'd taken a taken a job just to just to have some structure in my life uh during that time um as well as pay some bills uh, at a at a bicycle shop and and that was great i mean that that really did work well for me for a time uh but there but there wasn't any there wasn't a creative outlet there and so uh so yeah all the 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 uh the heavy anxiety period of anxiety and and the deep depression was without uh, with it was without art yeah yeah and the the thing the the moment that you know helped wake me up and bring me back to you know my artistic life and was uh so i i met uh, my current wife cynthia um during this time and it was <laughs> i just, it, uh, just imagining that the, the the feeling you have when you're kind of at a bottom and you meet somebody remarkable and you're like boy <laughs> do i have a treat for you <laughs> it was well the, the the timing couldn't have been worse yeah no, um, exactly. i had just you know i was just a few months out of you know past my divorce mm-hmm. and and uh, she was you know uh in a divorce and uh we we both really could have used you know a few years right. uh, before meeting each other but that's not how it went no. we met and yeah. And we connected very deeply and we fell in love. And, Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I, 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 no, I wasn't ready for it, but it happened. Yeah. And anyways, we had, at one point we went, uh, she came home to Louisiana with me and we went to visit my parents in Alexandria in central Louisiana. And we stayed there for a couple nights and my mother was, uh, taking Cynthia around the house and kind of giving her a little tour of, you know, my parents have a lot of, they've just got a lot of interesting stuff in their house and, mm-hmm. and pottery and, and art. And so she, she's showing Cynthia around the house and, and then, uh, Cynthia comes out from the back of the house and she, and she, she gets it, she gets in my grill and she's like, what's the deal? And, you know, and she's, I could tell she's a little irritated with me. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, well, every room that I walk into with your mom, I, I look up and I see some amazing piece of art on the wall that really draws me to it. And I ask her, oh, who did that? And she says, it's you. What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she's like, well, how come I don't know about this? And. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, 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 right. you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, well, I just I haven't been doing it, you know. And she's like, uh, "Well, you need to this, you know. I mean, it, your 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 gift is is right. This is incredible. It's clear, you know. Anyways, mm-hmm. that's what she thinks, you know. So, yeah. um, and she, you know, she knew I was a musician that was not really active and. Um, like she pushed me, she pushed me hard, you know, you, yeah. you need to be, you, you need to be creative. And so I started, uh, started, started working again. Mm-hmm. Um, and like immediately was, 
energized and yeah. felt lifted up and you know found my days had had a whole new purpose again and and so i didn't have it was in a little like you know shitty you know post divorce apartment right. um that you know everything was kind of falling apart in the place and mm-hmm. you know i was just making do and and anyways i would set up on my bed every evening i'd get out my inks and my paper and that was that was my work table, you know, and right. uh, it was great. Yeah. It was great. I still have the stuff that I did during that time, and 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 then I I not long after that I moved from Athens into Atlanta and and moved into the house I'm I'm still at, and um, I set up a little studio in there and started, you know, getting really really uh, busy with with painting and and doing the ink work and Mm -hmm. i actually had had decided um at that time that i need i needed to do something to really uh really activate this you know Mm -hmm. and get my discipline back and to give yourself a deadline or something yeah kind of like that well what i did though so i'm my my favorite visual artist uh is cy twombly Mm -hmm. and uh his work just always has always resonated with me and and has you know just brought me to tears many a time and and just be, just because it resonates so deeply you right. know for me and and uh so there's a particular Cy Twombly piece that resides in the Philadelphia Museum of Art uh, it's called 50 Days at Ilium and it's it's a series of of I believe it's 10 panels large mural sized panels on, on canvas um his uh, his representation of of the the Trojan War and mm-hmm. uh, it's it's just stunning, absolutely stunning. The whole thing it's got its own room, and so I decided uh, that I would do fifty days. You know, inspired by fifty days at Ilium, I would I would do work for fifty days consecutively. Every day, I would sit down at at the drafting table and and render at minimum one piece of work. And by imposing that, you know, guideline for myself was was great. It really yeah. got me got me going again. And on some days I would do one piece, and other days I would do eight or ten. And I started sure. to become really prolific. And mm-hmm. so I have this whole body of work now that's I don't know, it's probably probably about seventy pieces, mm-hmm. ink on all ink on paper. Um, with with also some some artist marker and 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 pencil, uh, that that it, it's almost like a journey through my my anxiety and depression of the time. Yeah, you know, because I was still struggling very much at the time. I and mean, this is the time where during the time when I was cutting myself and right. and where I was having a lot of suicidal ideation. And at one point, I I did end up in the hospital. I put myself in the hospital because I. I, I had a day where I was really, really scared. I, I did not want to kill myself, but I was afraid that I might not have the ability to stop myself right. because I'd become, you know, so serious and the, and the planning was, you know, was fully fleshed out and, and all right. that. And so, um, again, a, a, a really difficult time. So but at some it, point but, you were... You were sort of idly imagining or passively planning a suicide, and then somehow that tipped over into having concrete steps that were in place. Yeah. And that's when you decided to go to the hospital. Am I, am I mm. understanding that correctly? Uh, you know, it, not exactly. I, it, mm. it was... I, don't know, I was just in the middle of all of it, you yeah. know? And yeah. I... You know, I... I called my therapist on this particular day and said, I, I, I don't feel like I'm in control of, of, you know, of things. And I don't, I don't know if I'm going to make it through the night. And yeah. we decided the best thing was for me to, you know, to go, you know, to the hospital and, Self-admit. you know, yeah. yeah. So, um, nah, that turned out to be a real nightmare, but, um, but it's just the, the details of that are not really important. But one thing that, that important that happened mm-hmm. while I was in the hospital, um, 
and you know unfortunately i i actually uttered the words to you know the the uh you know their their social worker yes i am thinking of killing myself and so they had to lock me up right, right? so i spent the night in the in the locked psychiatric ward but they had a they had a uh uh yeah you know like a a, a marker board mm-hmm. big marker board in one of the rooms and uh so i didn't have my ink and paper but i i went found a marker and i i rendered my piece for the day yeah. you know on the thing and that was really important for me to do Mm-hmm. And um, so two things that happened. You said one thing that happened in the hospital, you were able to render your art, but the other thing is that you didn't die. I didn't. I didn't. And yeah. and I, and I had the. I was I was just fortunate enough to be able to speak up and say I need help. I can't I can't do this right. alone right now. You know I can't be on my own. And um, you know and 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 uh, my parents showed up. You know, they drove over from Louisiana um, when they when they found out, How and was that? Uh, and they came and picked me up. And How was that? It was good. Good. It was good. You know, okay. I mean, you know, you know that things have been really hit and mess with me and my folks over the years, and yeah. um, you know, there's, I mean, I haven't, I've certainly not been like the easiest child to raise you know i mean i would say you know <laughs> yeah. i'm probably amongst the uh the, the more difficult ones mm-hmm. uh and and likewise you know i don't i wouldn't i don't have a hard time throwing my parents under the bus where <laughs> you know where where <laughs> yeah. they you know yeah. where, where they made mistakes yeah sure um but they were there for me and yeah. um and then that was a that was a that was a powerful moment uh so you you seem that seems to have been like a, a another bottom. There's been sort of three serious bottoms of where you got to a point where you were needed help from the outside. And, uh, so, sort of one of the things that one of the missions of this podcast is to have these conversations and figure out where the whole passive idea of self harm becomes active. Because I think that there's a moment, like most of us sit around and think, well, I'm I'm really feeling pretty bad right now, but I'm not going to kill myself. Until there's a moment where you think, well, am I? You know, and because if you look back, Anthony Bourdain was a big inspiration for doing this because here's a guy that everybody thought was pretty together. But if you look back through his body of work, there's many times where he says, well, this kind of thing makes me want to hang myself. Makes me want to throw a rope over a stout overhead beam. It says that was a joke he made over and over. And then one day he fucking did it. And nobody saw it coming. But it was sort of there. So I was just sort of putting a marker in this conversation here. Is like, oh, okay. So there was a point where you saw the writing on the wall, which is I'm really not in a place where I'm going to continue to take care of myself or continue to actively avoid self-harm. And so you checked in somewhere. And I think that that is something that I think it's important that we don't think of that as a drastic measure that we can't take, that it's something sometimes we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, this is the first time I've spoke really openly outside of, you know, private conversations with, you know, my therapist or mm-hmm. with, you know, close friends or, 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 or Cynthia, you know, and, you know, I feel well, it really sucks all the, you know, how, how much mental health issues are, are stigmatized because even now I feel a little bit silly, like, saying this, you know. It's um, funny because which from is sh- where it's I'm just sitting, shit, you know. It doesn't seem silly at all. Well, it's it's not, is it? No, it's right? fucking, it's real life. And, you know, so Cynthia, she's not, uh, she's, she's not, uh, you know ever had a you know depression diagnosis like i have and she's not she's not had the mental health issues i have but she has had family members that have and so somehow she grew up with uh, this incredible ability to uh support and love people through those times and Mm -hmm. and she's amazing with me when you know because i'm in and out of depressions i mean it's it's i accept it as being part of my life Mm -hmm. and uh, I, and I and and I'm continually developing better skills with 
with managing and and getting past these times but she's incredibly patient and what i try and do if i'm going through a depression is is let her know about it mm -hmm. and and tell her you know i'm 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 going to be okay, but I'm just, here's how I'm feeling and here's right. what's going on with me. And she just tells me, okay, I'm here. And you just let me know what it is that I can do to best help you. Mm -hmm. Let me know what you need me not to do. Right. And, you know, we communicate about it mm -hmm. and we get through it, you know, and I know that it can be, you know, things like depression, anxiety, and other uh, mental health issues can be things that, that break relationships apart, right. you know. Uh, so we've worked really hard to navigate through them, mm -hmm. and I'm super thankful for her the way that, that, that she just loves me unconditionally through it and, and, and also just is she's just so willing to hold my hand or, or yeah. back off, you know, and give me, give me the space I need. My wife and I's ability to deal honestly with our own battles with anxiety and depression has made our relationship a lot stronger. And I think that really, for me, the key there mm -hmm. is to communicate your needs yeah. to your significant other. And if you don't have, um, you know, a uh, you know a significant other, you know, love relationship in your life, is to you know friends or family, you know, whoever it is that you right. trust, you got to communicate your needs to them. And tell them how they can help you because not everybody, you know, most people don't know what to do. You know, oh, yeah. you're depressed. You know, can I, you know, uh, what would make you happy? Well, fuck, nothing is going to make me happy. That's right. the whole thing with depression. I mean, no matter how hard I try, I can, mm -hmm. you know, do all the favorite things I like doing and, and eat my favorite foods and do this and do that. But nothing is making me happy because that's just not you know the, the the whatever it is the dynamic that's going on with one's brain chemistry um with 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 you know the sociology of it I, you know you're not gonna feel happy right so you just need to look more towards how are you going to manage through it i think that the thing we talked about earlier about the difference between being happy and having a will to live is sometimes dependent, especially if we were in codependent relationships when we were younger, uh, that if the par if we're with a partner who understands it and supports it and doesn't just like give up on you because you're having a downturn uh, is really crucial to your survival. Absolutely. I Absolutely. Think, go, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that um, that's the difference between making it through it and not making it through it. Yeah. Yeah, like it's not an exaggeration to say that my wife has saved my life. You know, I, I try. Well, for starters, I I think the pursuit of happiness is is bullshit. Okay. Yeah. Um, That's very French of you. I think <laughs> I think it's I think it's just a trap, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, you know, a number of years ago, came to the realization that that it was a trap, at least for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I look more to have, uh, have some peace yeah, and, um, and some acceptance and some fulfillment, mm -hmm. you know, if possible. But, um, you know, I, I have a reputation for kind of being like, you know, guy with dark energy and mm -hmm. uh, he always wears black and he probably wears black on the outside because black is how he feels on the inside. Right. And well, I mean, that's yeah. not, that's not at all the case, you know, um, yeah. I, I wear black on the outside because black looks good. You know, yeah. I don't know. I wear whatever. It doesn't show coffee simple stains. And, but, yeah. 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 Um, cause I look stupid in red. I look <laughs> like a buffoon <laughs> in, in red and yellow. Uh, yeah. So anyways, um, you know, I much prefer to go through life acknowledging the dark stuff, you know, mm -hmm. acknowledging the hard stuff, acknowledging the unpleasant stuff. And I want to I want to be open about those things. I want to talk about those things. Mm -hmm. Life isn't all, uh, you know, roses. Um, so why pretend why try and pretend that it is or should be or can be? It's just not. Right. And. We all have ups and downs, and it doesn't matter whether you have, have challenges with mental illness or not. We just all do. So, you know, I say, if not for the darkness, there would be no light. Right. You know, I mean, it's all, it, the darkness is as real as, 
you know, the down times are as real as the up times. And so I, you know, I try and impart that to my stepson, you know. Yeah. Let me like, bring, let me ask you this. If your stepson was to ask you the same question about depression that he did about diabetes, if there was a cure for depression, would you take it? Ooh, you just asked me that. Yeah. Man, you know, uh, I would gladly give up my depression. Yeah. Yeah, in a heartbeat. Me too, man. Yeah. <laughs> I still think I'd still be able to play drums, but I might get at the back of the line. I'd let, <laughs> I'd let a couple of my friends go in front of me. Yeah. Because I, I worry about them every day. Yeah. Every day. Yeah, I, you and I have both lost a lot of friends. a lot of friends yeah. to 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 uh to different, suicides different to, kinds of suicides to, to, to drug overdoses suicide on the installment know. plan yeah yeah and uh you know i don't you know as far as you know uh, mental health issues and creativity i i you know i i just don't buy into the whole thing of you know you got to be to be a good artist you got to be miserable it's just crap and i don't know if it's true then I think that you know. that's a comfortable misery the sort of middle class misery like oh if you're going to be a great artist you have to suffer i'm like man i don't think you've suffered to the point where you've been unable to create you wouldn't say stupid shit like that you know right uh, but that's just you know that's just my personal opinion but uh, you know yeah like the the just the the, the idiots that you that you meet you know mm-hmm. oh oh so you're a starving artist huh I never said I was starving. I just yeah. said I was an artist. I, why, you know, I mean, there's this, this, there's this stigma attached to just being an artist, you know, like, yeah, like you must be a little bit crazier off. Or you I just, don't know. Or you deserve to starve. Or you deserve to starve. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, this has been a, a, a great conversation. I, I, I end my interviews with, uh, six questions. Um, and, uh, I think that, they sort of get at some of what's important about life to me. Um, I, you're probably familiar with the, the 10 questions that they end the actor studio with James Lipton asked the 10 questions. They're actually from a, a, a writer from France called Bernard Pivot. But um, I think everybody's heard those questions enough time. They sort of have preconceived notions about how they might answer them. So I came up with, with originally five of my own and now six, and I'm sort of contemplating a seventh. We'll see how it goes. I hope that maybe at some point it'll be 10, but anyway, um, if you're up for that, I'll start. Absolutely. First question. Uh, what is your, uh, fondest memory of a meal you've ever had? Um, I would say, uh, gumbo. I make gumbo every Halloween mm-hmm. and I go out, uh, on my driveway at the edge of the street and I just feed anybody walking by anybody who wants it. That's interesting. So it's not something someone else gave you, but something that you gave to someone. Oh man, I make and I make I make a shitload of it. I I, I mm-hmm. make you know like sixty quarts. You're big on the big pot of of uh, of, of food. You fed me uh, pozole more than once. Hey, you know food delicious. is you know yeah. that's a and that's a that's a New Orleans or Louisiana real Louisiana thing. You know you make. You make a gumbo, you mm-hmm. you know, you invite over the neighbors or you bring some over to the neighbors. You should share food. You share the the, the, the food experience I with people. I think that's a working class thing that I sort of brought forward from my grandparents. I love that Cab Calloway song, Everybody Eats When They Come to My House. Nice. It's fucking true. Nobody's leaving my house yeah. hungry, man. I'm not yeah. going to let that happen. So, um, Second question. What is the most frightened you've ever been? Yeah, I, th- I think it would have to be that that day that I was that I ended up in the hospital in 2012 and mm-hmm. I was you know I was cut myself pretty good that day and yeah yeah things were things I was really frightening um third question what is what is the thing that you've lost that you you miss the most mm-hmm. gosh this sounds so cliche but I you know I think my youth. I feel like I lost my youth to depression and mm-hmm. my diabetes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, what is your favorite place in the world to gig? Hmm. I guess, uh, man, I love playing London. I mean, London yeah. is, you know, London's my favorite city. Uh, did, did you ever play the Luminaire in London? No, never played Luminaire. I played there a couple of times. It was my favorite live venue for years. They had big signs up that says, if you want to talk, go downstairs. This is a live music venue. It's for listening. That's great. And That's they would, great. They would come tap people on the shoulder and say, there's a bar downstairs if you'd like to talk. And they would send people out of the venue if they were going to yip yap through the show. I think, I think, um, I think, you know, my favorite gigs are always, almost always in really small places, you know, mm-hmm. I, the, the, the smaller the club, the better, you know, uh, but that said, I love playing uh, on the floor at eye level with the audience. Yeah. I don't like playing on the floor. I, I, I need yeah. a stage. I mean, there, there's something like I need that. There's a certain amount of grandeur I have to have. I've got a drum set between me and the yobs. Well, there so, you go. Yeah. But uh, I'll certainly never forget though playing playing Brixton Academy in '96, mm-hmm. opening for Rage Against the Machine. We did actually a three and a half week tour with them. But on this particular gig, the opening night of the tour uh, at Brixton, it was a 1996, the day of the FA Cup final between Liverpool FC and Man United, mm-hmm. and you know all the punters had been in the in the pubs all day long yeah. drinking, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And we we came out on stage and we played two heavy heavy songs first, and mm-hmm. audience wasn't sure if they were into it, and then and then James, you know, said he wanted to do the power ballad third, and I I, I tried to warn him off it, and, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the audience just turned on us yeah. and started throwing. 50p coins at us and mm-hmm. you know those big ones you know yeah, yeah. um and and you know and 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 uh and full water bottles you know for for the rest of the 45 minutes set yeah. it was brutal but you know kind of amazing at the same time so yeah london all right um visa and income considerations aside where would you live if you could live anywhere well maybe london um new york i love new york and it's just mm-hmm. prohibitively expensive i can't do it my, it's changed my wife a lot. and i yeah it's changed a lot and and uh but i i, st- I still love it and I've got you know dear friends there uh but I, I also really like madrid man i love madrid actually i like barcelona a little better I, and i haven't been to, to barcelona uh, berlin 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 i could live there yeah i've got a uh, the former tour manager of, of a band that I went to the uh, EU with years ago is now living in Berlin, and he seems really happy with his family. Um, sixth question. Uh, what is your perfect instrument, and do you already own it? Mm. I don't know if there is. I mean, I feel like I own... My, I, I feel like I own the three perfect instruments, mm-hmm. uh, but there's not necessarily one. You know, I played, I played Fenders, yeah. you know, most of my career, and I have this '72 P bass that's that's just incredible, and it has, it has a uh, the neck is a jazz profile. It's a stock neck though, mm-hmm. and um, I love that thing. But you know, in the last two three years, I've been playing a Rickenbacker 4003, mm-hmm. which it has there there's so many things wrong with Rickenbackers and you have to you have to mod <laughs> them before they're really properly playable or intonatable and sound right but I love it and it just I don't know to me it's a real instrument of violence and and you can just get such aggressive sounds out of it's great and then I have this semi custom made fretless that I've been playing a whole lot in the last year that mm-hmm. that um it's just this beautiful mahogany bodied uh, jazz body with the with the jazz neck and a PJ pickup combo mm-hmm. and it just sings it just plays itself yeah uh, I, here's a question I'm going to try out um, let's, maybe this is our, the birth of this of the seventh question but um, what other job if you had to give up music would you do I'd be a drummer <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you walk, you walked this, me then. into it no yeah. no no so, I, uh, you know what I don't, 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 actually drummer i i really wish i was a drummer i've always was i good and i yeah, just can't do it i try <laughs> um i you know yeah. what i i would just uh, if if ever i can't play music hopefully my hands are still working well enough that i can i can just Paint. do visual art yeah yeah 
Hey, mm-hmm. did you hear what the bass player got on his SAT test? <laughs> what? Barbecue sauce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you know what he used for birth control? No. His personality. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, man, this is this has been great uh, and incredibly. I've had several people sit down and do interviews uh, with me and, and cry, but that's the first time. It's someone's gotten to me like that. I'm, it, uh, man, this has been a, a extraordinary, and I'm deeply grateful for both I'm, this and your friendship. I'm deeply grateful for our friendship as well, and and I appreciate so much that you're taking the time and and the energy to to do this and get people talking about this. I'm just trying to drag as many people out of the tunnel as I can. And I think people should any anyone listening to this should know that that both of us are people who are willing to listen and hold your hand if you need it yeah don't go without anybody that's true i love you man i love you too Ooh, man that was intense everybody okay everybody hanging in there that was a lot man that's grant curry that's one of my best friends in the world and someone i love very much and we've been through a lot together he's been through a lot um it was good man. that was a good talk um I want to remind everybody, if you're struggling with depression and anxiety, if you're struggling with thoughts of self-harm, if you feel like you need help and you need help now, you can always call 1-800-273-8255. That's the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. 1-800-273-8255. Also, I'm a member of the Facebook group, Dudes Helping Dudes. Get on there. Talk to us. Those are your peers. Those are people who've been through what you're going through. We can get through this together. Reach out. Stay alive. Be here tomorrow. And remember, loud guitars save lives.